for those of you who don't know me, I am Leah Pickett. And it is such an honor and a pleasure to be trusted by our awesome pastors, Pastor Anthony and Pastor Brenda Vaughn, to stand before you. And not only do we give them honor because they're the spiritual leaders of this house, but they are celebrating 70 years of marriage today. Happy anniversary. And I thank you that as our leaders, that you are always a demonstration of not just godly leaders, but what marriage as Christians looks like. And for those of us who are married and those pursuing marriage, this is what right looks like. And for that, we give God praise. So I'm partially hoarse from just now, but I'm mostly hoarse because yesterday as sisterhood, Pastor Brenda brought that fire. And I tell you, it was a tremendous time in the Lord to be in such an intimate setting where God will come and just sit with you. And that's what we just experienced, where he just comes. And no matter what place we are and what we look like, like right now, I hope we all sweated out your hair like I did. But he is here with us to celebrate the goodness of all that he is. And there's a lot to celebrate at celebration, all the puns intended. Uh, in just uh, less than a week, I will celebrate my birthday. But I'm not the only one. I give a shout out to all my November babies, especially our outreach director, Shamina Kingsley, whose birthday is today. I give honor to this house and especially my husband, and my boys, whose love and support allows me to do what I do. As we're talking about celebrations and holidays, I've grown up believing that my birthday was a national holiday. I mean, it's close, it's next to Veterans Day and we give honor to those who serve, but my birthday, the day that God put Leah Pickett on the earth, I felt was special. And I grew up believing everybody treated birthdays the same way. The first time I met someone that was like, oh, my birthday, yeah, I'm not really, it's just another day. I was like, ah! unheard of. Birthdays for me are like that part in the movie Elf where Will Ferrell's at the mall. Right? Y'all remember that? Santa's coming to town! Santa! Oh my God! Santa here? I know him. Birthdays! Oh my gosh! I, I needed you to be in that moment with me about how special birthdays are. So much so that every year on November 1st, I started what my family and friends know as the Leah birthday countdown song. Every year. Pastor Brenda, every year on November 1st, I started a countdown to my birthday to the tune of the 12 days of Christmas, because it's on the 12th. On the first day till my birthday for my friends and family. You're feeling it, right? And every day for 12 days, I would blast to the world either what I wanted or what I was grateful for or some blessing I had. God bless me with an amazing hubby. Right? That's how it is. Right? See what I did there? See what I did there? Right? And I did this for decades. As far back as I can remember. Year after year after year. And then one year, on November 1st came and almost went, and my phone started to blow up. Messages, are you okay? Are you alive? What is wrong? Why? Because the birthday countdown didn't go out. See, as you get older, you start getting reflective. You start adulting at some point, right? Like in your 20s, you're living your best life. And then for me, my 30s was like, the new 20s, because I realized, wow, I wasn't that bright in the 20s. And then you get to the fabulous 40s. And you start getting reflective. I started getting reflective. And the further I got into my 40s, the more my reflections started to shift. I all of a sudden wasn't looking at birthdays like elf. I started looking back at my life and with each year that grew on the calendar, that was another year that I felt like, what haven't I done yet? And instead of being excited about what was to come, 
It was like one side of my life was this version of what I thought it should be at this age. And on this side, it was what it really was. And they didn't match. And I started paying more and more attention to what wasn't on that side. The dreams that I thought I would have accomplished by now. And it doesn't help you go to the doctor and they say things like, well, at your age. <laughs> like, I don't notice all these changes. Thank you. <laughs> but it became very real to me that there were some regrets, disappointments. There are some things that I look back on and if I can just be very transparent today, I ask God, well, why not me? How did I get this far and all these things didn't happen? And I wasn't adding the word yet anymore. If I can be beyond transparent, I thought my best days were behind me. Now, Pastor Anthony done spoiled the message. And then Pastor Brenda, she said, your latter days will be greater. And she, she gave me, she said what that but God moment I had in my life. How many of us had a but God? And he stepped in and he said, eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard. Neither has entered into the hearts of man what I have for you, Leah. It wasn't in here. It was in here. How many messages have we heard? The best is yet to come. They even have a song. The best is yet to come. Y'all know the song? It was in here. But the truth was, I couldn't see it in my life. And so God showed me what I'm calling today's message. Reframing is required. <laughs> In our time together, I want to take a moment just to calm down and unpack what was a beyond supernatural tool that God has used to change my life. And I'm praying that if you can resonate just a little bit, if there's any part of your life that you look back on and wonder what happened, if there's any point in your life where all of a sudden you found yourself on your knees because life had hit you in the gut, and all you could do was look up and say, why me? Sometimes our Christian friends have the, the best intentions. We go to them as believers and the Bible tells us we should have wise counsel. Pastor Brenda taught us yesterday out of Job that when he had gone through all those things, he sat before the wise counsel. And at some point, not only did they not validate that he just felt crappy about life? But they convinced him that maybe it was his fault. And so as I went before some friends feeling like my life is not quite what I thought it would be, even with the best of intentions, well, you just got to change the way you see things. So Leah, life question, how? <laughs> I would love to. Even though God's word told me my best days were in front of me, I only saw them behind me. And spoiler alert, I was just negative. I had a negative outlook on life. I know that's not all sunshiny, like, yay, Christian. Uh, news break, Christians can be negative. <laughs> Y'all remember Doubting Thomas? It's in the name. <laughs> he was negative and he was limited. And so was I. I was limited because I was focused on what was and what wasn't. But I did not know how to take what God had said and change my lens to clear what was right in front of me and replace it with what he promised me. So let's jump into why reframing is required. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines reframe as to frame something again and often in a different way. So what does that mean? That means we're creating a different way of looking at something. We're creating a different way of seeing our situation, possibilities and relationships. We're creating alternatives 
that have not occurred within the old frame. So what does that look like as a believer? That means reframing is reinterpreting our, the meaning of our lives based on God's truth. Now this does not mean that we ignore the bad and the uncomfortable and the yucky stuff that is happening to us. That's real. But it doesn't mean that we focus on it. We get to choose. And reframing means that we choose to focus on the things that are good and that are positive. Reframing creates opportunities and says, what's possible? What else can be happening here? So where do we see reframing in the Bible? One of the best reframers of all time was the Apostle Paul. Now, y'all know his life, shipwrecked, snake bitten, put in prison, left for dead. I mean, it's like the 12 days, but really, really bad. (laughs) But he shared the secret of his victory and overcoming. Written from a jail cell, he makes this assertion in Philippians 4.12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul tells us he had to learn the secret. It wasn't just given to him. Even as an apostle, it just, just wasn't sitting around Jesus and all of a sudden all this came upon him. No, he still had to learn it through all the things that he went through. And he, he learned the secret of contentment because he was in a lot of discontent situations. So what did he learn? If you're taking notes, point one is reframing requires a mindset shift. Paul was in prison and said he knew what it was like to be content. I don't know about you, but content is not the word I would use in prison. He could say he was content because he could see his situation differently because he had a different mindset. He never said that it was fun in prison. He didn't say that he was popping up petunias being there. He never negated that the situation was what it was. He just didn't focus on it because he saw more than his circumstances presented. He recognized that his current situation was a part of a larger story, which allowed him to reframe being in prison. Philippians 2, 5 in King James says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Now, I've heard that time and time again. It's one of those, you know, bless the elders. Well, you got to let the mind of Jesus be in you. How? The New Living Translation tells us your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. Now, that's a little different having the same attitude because now I can go back and remember Jesus got angry sometimes. He kicked over some tables. (laughs) Jesus didn't like when people was mistreated. Jesus cried out before God and said, take this cup from me. At some point along life's journey, we get taught that we can't tell God we're upset about stuff, but he can handle it. (laughs) That's a part of the relationship that he wants us to have is be real with me. He's a really big God. He can take our tiny little fist sometimes saying, God, I don't understand. But sometimes we suffer in silence. We don't want people on the outside to know that, or we don't want to appear as maybe we're doubtful because that's not the Christian way of, of being. But even Jesus said, this is hard. So we can choose to see things differently. Right after Jesus asked God to take the cup from him, he said, nevertheless, not my will. He knew the bigger picture. He knew what had to happen in order for us to be sitting here today, praising his name. One of my favorite life scriptures is Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we renew our minds is when we shift our mindset to have the same attitude and that same lens 
that Jesus has. When we renew our minds, we can reframe any situation. By reframing his circumstances, Paul was able to find peace in a situation that would have broke most of us. He didn't wish that he was somewhere else. Instead, he wrote letters of encouragement to other people. He wasn't deceived into thinking that maybe this is just my lot in life. And friends, that was a point that I had gotten to. You know what? Maybe the dreams that I once had weren't really for me. Maybe, maybe this is all that there is and I should just accept it. But Leah, how do you know Paul was really reframing? It matches the story, but how do you really know? I'm so glad that you asked, Sarah. <laughs> We know reframing was required because a few verses earlier in verse eight, Paul gave this charge. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble and right and pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He couldn't possibly tell us to think about all these lovely things if he had not seen it for himself and reframed his situation. Paul knew his purpose and he was no longer looking at what was right in front of him, jail bars, but he was looking through the lens of purpose. I know this is easier said than done because this is my story and I'm living it. Not just lived it, I'm living it. I've asked myself the questions, how can anything positive come from this? How do I look at the situation any differently than what it is? Especially if our hearts are broken or we're feeling the weight of the situation. What makes it hard to reframe is that we're not wired to do it. We're in this fallen body. The Bible wouldn't tell us to renew our minds if when we profess Jesus, all of a sudden, poof, we had renewed minds. That means there's work for us to do. We go to heaven when we profess Jesus, but this earth suit needs some work. We've been brought up in a deficit framing world. We're told to put on our resume that we're good problem solvers. That is such a deficit frame. That means we're always looking for a problem to fix. How many of us have expert opportunity finder? Nobody. Because the society that we're in says things are wrong and you need to fix it. You need fixed. Satan convinced Eve that she needed fixed. That she was missing something, right? The original FOMO. God said, don't eat this fruit because he doesn't want you to be like him. You're missing out. The truth was, she was already like him. God created them in his image. In his image and his likeness. And guess what? So are we. So are we. What makes reframing challenging and unlikely is that the enemy very subtly gets us to focus on what is. It's a subtle distraction because if it were blaring, well, we could see right through that. But it's it's subtle, right? This is what's right in front of you, and it hurts. So how how can what God said about you be true? Because if if it was, this wouldn't be happening, right? A little, in my world, we call it a chattering monkey. But in Tom and Jerry, it was that little red devil that sat on his shoulder. (laughs) The enemy gets us to stay in a deficit frame and keep our focus a keep our focus on the negative. Why? Because point two, reframing requires faith. If he can keep us focused on the negative, then he can keep us in a defeated posture on the path to defeat. You won't believe your situation can change, and so you won't be able to see that it's possible. Hebrews 11, 6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. So look at the trap that's being laid. If he can keep whispering that this situation is hopeless, there's no chance 
that it can change. Or if, I mean, if it were going to, it would have already, right? Then the words that you need to change the situation are not what's being fed and watered in your spirit. (laughs) It is the opposite. And now you are walking in doubt and unbelief. And the Bible says we can't even please God. So then where are we? In a place where we don't want to go to the only person that could change it. And that's how he starts to isolate us. Get us alone. Get us in a place of shame and embarrassment where we don't even want to tell someone how we are thinking and feeling because now what are they going to think? And in that lone, dark place, he slams that mental prison door shut. Reframing is seeing through the lens of faith. It doesn't take faith to see our current situation for what it is. It doesn't take faith for me to believe this stage is going to hold me up. But if I walked out onto the edge of it and started to step off, I need all your faith, right? (laughs) To be in the midst of tremendous heartbreak, hurt, pain, devastation, and see a different outcome requires faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, familiar scripture, but look at it in the Amplified. Now, faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation. That's usually the part that we hang out on. It's the confirmation of things hoped for. And in this, and in this verse, hope for means believe for. So we're saying that because I believe it, I have confirmation of it. And that's kind of where we stop. But there's an and, the evidence of things not seen. Sila, not seen. The conviction of their reality. Faith cannot be experienced by the physical senses. So friends, I'm here to tell you, if you can touch it, taste it, feel it, see it, sniff it, that does not require faith. But what does is sitting in the doctor's office being told this situation is hopeless and seeing yourself healed and walking out of that office with a complete report that says, I am healed. It doesn't take faith to sit and look at your bank account and see all the messages that come through that this is due and that is due. But it takes faith to look at those messages in the eye and say, but you are already supplied. All my needs are supplied. If God said that I'm to owe no man anything but to love them, then I don't owe you. In the first book of James, it tells us very plainly. I told y'all, you're going to start to hear both our pastors have preached this message. Reframing is required to live a faith life. Because in James 1, 2 through 4, we're told to expect trials and tribulations. Not just to expect them, but he says, count it all joy. (laughs) That is laughable. (laughs) But this is what I love about the message translation, because this is Real Talk Sunday, right? And the message translation is very real. (laughs) Consider it a sheer gift, friends. (laughs) When tests and challenges come at you from all sides, not just this way, but this way and that way and that way, you know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work. Why? Pastor Brenda told us earlier, because God trusts us. When we let it do its perfect work, we become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. God is more concerned about your character than he is your comfort. We go through these trials not to feel defeated, but to come out as silver refined so that our lives are the testimony to other people that when we come out of that situation, they can look at us and go, if she could come out of it, so can I. 
Reframing requires faith. Otherwise, we see that test and trial as something happening to us instead of through us. Let me add here what reframing is not. It is not just saying these scriptures over and over again. Do you know how I know? Because that's what I kept saying. My best is yet to come, but I did not feel that. Just parenting the word is not what makes it change in our life. Reframing is not just looking at a situation that is very real. You're in a cast and saying, oh, my arm is not broken. No, it is very much broken. (laughs) Jason's in a boot. His ankle is in a boot. (laughs) But Jason is healed right there. What is the difference? We believe what we're saying. That is the transformation that happens when we renew our minds, that the words go from something on a page and on a screen to a power that starts bubbling up within us, that when it comes out of our mouth, things change. That's why reframing requires a shift for us to mentally examine our assumptions, for us to challenge our beliefs and our values. Do I really believe what the word says about this or does it just sound good to me? And if it only just sounds good, then there is no power. So how do I get that power? It isn't an easy process, but it is a life-changing process. Ultimately, and I'll close with point number three, reframing requires our trust in God's word. To God is his word. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. When we see his word, we see him. And let me tell you, there is nothing more freeing than to release our grip on the things of this world and to cling to that which is of eternal value. See, all this other stuff is going to pass away, but one thing remains, and that's the word of God. The Apostle Paul talked about this in in his second letter to the Christians in Corinth, and he instructed them to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, I'm going to be frank with you, friends. This was a trigger scripture for me. It was another one of those uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being transparent and vulnerable about how I feel. And, and here comes a lovely believer telling me, you got to capture that and make it obedient. And I, I heard it, but I, I felt like it was like Wonder Woman with a lasso. And I'm just trying to like capture these thoughts in my head. It was not working. How do we do that? So listen to it in the message translation. We use our powerful God tools. <laughs> for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God. Now that starts to tell me something. If my situation says that I am in lack, but the word says otherwise, then that is a barrier that needs to be torn down with a God tool, not with a Leah tool. See, that was the problem. Leah was trying to change the situation, but Leah can't change any situations until the the power of the word of God comes out of Leah's mouth. He said, with confession and belief, we see change. Fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. There's a theme about growing up. Maybe reframing requires maturity too. Reframing is simply reminding ourselves that no matter what the situation looks like, God is somehow in control that somehow he is working all of these things together for our good, for his sovereign plan for us that we may not always know, understand, or even like. It says in Romans 8.25 in the Amplified, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, 
causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose, and that is all of you. He has a good and perfect plan for us. And when we look at life through the lens of scripture, we can begin disrupting those negative thoughts. We can begin to see the possibilities of the alternative ways that things can change because now we have the power of the word rising in us that changes the way we see things. I can see what this looks like in the natural, but now through the lens of faith, I see through the supernatural. I see it how God sees it. God himself is our ultimate example of reframing. He doesn't see you how you are. He sees you how he created you to be. You see your failures and your shortcomings, but he sees prosperity. He sees everything your hand touches, prospers and succeeds. You see insecurities and brokenness, but he sees you as fearfully and wonderfully made. You see that maybe I haven't done the things that I wanted to do, or Leah, there's some things I can't even say in public, but he knows it and he still calls you my beloved. He sees you as the head and not the tail. You got passed over for that promotion, but he still has your name written on a new position that you don't even know is coming yet because he doesn't see you as failure. He sees you as the masterpiece that he created when he lifted up that dirt and he formed you with his own hands. When he poured his own love out into man and then he called your name. He said, this is my beloved Shamina. This is my Lavanda and my Lena. And I have a good plan for you. And I'm going to help you to see you the way I see you. No matter what you see yourself as, he only sees a masterpiece. And he doesn't make any mistakes. I open this story with the reflection of my birthday as in how I started to see two lives. The one I wish I had and the one I had. And the enemy was was so excited to see me spiraling in a downward depression of despair and hope lost. But God, he said in Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes so I can see what you show me of your miracles and your wonders. He stood me before a divine mirror and he showed me the version of myself that he created. He showed me how in this side of things that I thought should be, he was like, let me tell you, Leah, if I had let that thing happen, it would have killed you. If I let that situation work out, it would have taken you out. Do you know why you had to fight so hard? Why everything seemed like it was a struggle for you? Because one day you would stand up here and be able to tell other people that if you made it, so can they. He showed me how to reframe my life. Why did it take two decades for me to get a master's degree? Because guess what? That added 20 years of experience to my resume and now I'm working in my dream job. The old frame. Life is hard. That must be my lot in life. The reframe, ha ha, I know my God is faithful. I went through the deep waters and he was with me. I went through the rivers of difficulty and I did not drown. I went through the fire and I don't smell like smoke. Yes. Pastor Timberlake said, look again, look again. Yes. Through the eyes of faith, you are more than a conqueror. You are more than an overcomer. When the enemy comes in like a flood, reframing says he lifts up a standard and you can see it. When I thought my best days were behind me, <laughs> both pastors said it today, our latter and shall be greater. Double for your trouble. 
That's not just for Job. Claim that for yourself today. Double for my trouble. Oh no, not just two of you. All of you. Double for my trouble. Almost there. My latter days will be greater. Does someone other than Shemina believe that today? My latter days will be greater. Kickstart that reframing lens today and make the declaration that your latter days will be better. This is not where you end. This is the next chapter. This is not the final conclusion. There is a whole new beginning. God said all is well. And if all is well, all is not well, then this is not ended. If you can all join everyone else standing to your feet. If the challenges of life have had you seeing through a clouded lens of despair and depression, through a negative frame, and then maybe that voice has been saying to you that, you know what, this is it. This is all that you can expect. That road leads to a darkness. It leads to to anxiety and worry and stress. It's just a bunch of negative things that God did not design for us to carry or to experience. But reframing with God's word leads to gratitude, hope, and self-compassion. Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And that's the condition, my friends, with God. So if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you are seeing life through a lens that does not include him, today is the day to reframe. Today is the day to see your life with Jesus taking the wheel connected to the power source so that these words don't just sound good or or make for good means, but that you actually start to see change in your life when you say them. Your life is not hopeless. It is filled with promise when you have a personal relationship with Jesus. And maybe once you did look at life with faith-filled lenses. And the heartaches of life came and you caught the backhand of life and maybe along the way you just threw those lenses off completely. Come back. Come back home today. With all eyes closed and heads bowed, will you please pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins. And you rose from the grave. I turn away from that sinful life. And declare you are my Lord and Savior. My life is now changed. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or you rededicated your life, welcome home. Welcome home. Come on, Pastor Leah Pick. I just want to continue to call you Pastor Leah Pick. Come on. I just love what she said and what she preached about family, about reframing. Come on, somebody say that, reframe. It's time to reframe, right? Come on. Come on, man, as we get ready to stay in this posture of worship with the bringing of our tithe and the giving of our offering uh, here at Celebration Church, fam, we have, we have many ways that you can give and, and just continue to be obedient. Maybe, hey, maybe God is speaking to you today and even to our online family about reframing of what generosity is all about, family. And I can't, and I can't tell you guys so much of the generosity of this church. Come on, can we begin to put our hands together? The incredible work, family, that I'm telling you guys are making a huge impact. And we have some incredible outreach that's getting ready to take place in this month. And I just want to say thank you guys so much. Thank you on behalf of Pastor Brenda and myself and the team. I'm telling you, through your generosity, come on, souls are being saved. Come on, family. Through your generosity, come on, lives are being changed. Come on, family. 
through your generosity, I'm telling you, even domestically, but also globally, yeah. we're seeing the kingdom of God of continuing to move forward. And family, we continue to say this, when we put God first, the impossible can always happen. Amen. Amen. Let's pray for the offering. Father God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you so much for what you're doing in this place. We thank you that your glory is here. We thank you that you are cultivating an atmosphere where we can feel your presence, Lord. And even through this seed, we, we lift it up, Lord God, and to the, to the giver right now, begin to bless their household for our online family, Lord God. You are the one that does the multiplication, Lord God. So we lift up this seed offering. We lift it up to the blesser. And we ask that you only do what you can do, Lord God. Bless our seed. It is in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout amen. 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 amen, amen, amen. amen. As the buckets are being passed, we have, we have some incredible things that's happening. Come on, some incredible things happening. This yeah. is a unique month of, no, of November, family. I'm telling you. And we're calling this, I love this vision, family. We're calling this month that we're gathering through gratitude. gratitude. Gathering through gratitude and here, here's what I want to say about that family we're going to have as you can see they already start setting up some props behind us so we're actually not going to be having service here next Sunday come on we're going to actually be in Alexandria Virginia at the garden at the garden worship service. Come on. and we're going to be having a family worship so do me a huge favor come on invite your mama invite your father invite your, your next door neighbor invite your co-worker we're going to be having a family worship service together and we're going to gather with gratitude. Yeah. And also, what I love about this, even throughout this month, we're going to be having outreaches. Come on. Not only are we going to gather together through gather, uh, gratitude with family, but we're also going to gather and serve our community together. Come on, family. Yeah. And then we're going to have an online family where we actually want you to worship with your family and friends right in the comfort of your home. Because I really do believe this, family. Through this month, God is going to teach us something powerful through that gratitude. Amen. Amen. We got some amazing, some more we amazing do. things we happening. Do. We Come do. on. We do. We have a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> so with the holiday season upon us, um, as a community here, we will be creating what's called Blessing Bags. Come on. Come on. Yes, with non-perishables, with gift cards, the grocery stores. Um, and they'll be going out across the DMV area. So if you know someone in need or if you would like to be a blessing, you can text HOLIDAY to 703-844-1223. Come partner with us. Um, it's a great opportunity to pour out to the community. It's a great opportunity to be a blessing yeah. to others as well. This Sunday, we also have what's called Next Step Sunday. Next Step Sunday. So, yeah, wow. Next Step Sunday is happening right after service in the classroom to the left. If you are looking to get connected or if you have questions or you um, want to talk to me, come meet me in the classroom to the left right after service. I would love to meet you, love to connect with you and um, complete a connect card and see where you can get plugged in at with this beautiful community that we have here. Amen. Amen. Come on. So many, so many incredible things is happening here at Celebration. But as we get ready to dismiss family, come on, just open up your palm of your hand. Just receive this blessing. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for always gathering with us. Thank you that you shine your face towards us and you always give us peace. We ask that your countenance always shine from heaven. Give us gratitude this week. Give us patience this week. But even most importantly, Heavenly Father, through this benediction, give us peace. So as we leave this place, Lord God, we ask for your safety and your comfort until we meet again. We glorify the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody shout amen. Amen, amen. We love you guys so much. Enjoy your week, family.